We don't have Mark here. Uh, some of you may have read this morning from Slack that he is actually running a marathon this morning. So um, that's been a really uh, long goal of his, and he is finally doing it today, so we're excited for him. Um, so instead, we have um, Matt Clever. He is here from Sarnia. Um, he and his wife Erin planted Anthem Church in Sarnia just over a year ago. Anthem Church seeks to bring glory to God and make disciples by leading people to grow in their affection to, for Jesus and their neighbor. One of his favorite things to do is remind Mark how old he is, but I think he's kind of proving us wrong today. <laughs> Welcome, Matt. So Mark wrote that. I didn't write that. So the good thing about Mark is he always asks for my opinion on things and then doesn't listen to me and then does what he wants anyway. I don't remind him how old he is, but... We are all going to after his marathon, right? That is what we are going to do. So yes, my name is Matt. It's a privilege to be here. I've been here a couple of times. I'm very forgettable, so if you don't remember, that's why. Um, so Mark asked me to come and preach while he is running a marathon. If you don't know what a marathon is, let me explain. So a gun goes off, or a horn, or a bell, or a whistle, or whatever and then you start running and that's it you just keep running and then when your legs start to burn and your intestines want to explode you're about halfway done friends I don't want you running and telling Pastor Mark saying Matt talked about hell but this is what hell is like <laughs> the guest preacher came and taught us about hell this is hell friends just running and country music. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yes. I wanted to see who's angry and who thinks that joke is funny. And then at the end of the race, Mark might win, but he's old. There. See, I did it. Fulfilled prophecy. He's probably going to get a high five. Truly, uh, running a race is for psychopaths. So if you had any doubts about Forward City, and you're worrying about Pastor Mark, <laughs> there you go. There's your clue. Dude's crazy. Um, so, and, and I was fighting it. I was fighting talking about the marathon, because it was such low-hanging fruit as a sermon illustration. But I kept hitting my head on it, because it was so low-hanging. So tonight, today, we're going to, sorry, I do church Saturday night. So if I say night, I mean day. Um, and, and so here's the deal. We pastors try and not write sermons again. We try and recycle material. We love you, just not that much, right? And so he's like, hey, so we've been preaching about prayer. And I'm like, hey, I haven't been. However, when I was thinking about uh, the series that we're going through at Anthem called on, on James, the book of James, I couldn't help but come back to uh, James 1. So we covered James 1 together over the last number of weekends. And uh, so I'm not going to do all of James 1 for you for a couple of reasons. One, that's too much information and doesn't suit our purposes this morning. The other reason is there's like seven or eight people here this morning from Blenheim. And that means the other seven or eight people from Blenheim are wondering where half their town went. So we have to hasten before there's a crisis on our hands of half a population of a town gone missing. Thank you. <laughs> Last time I was here, the Blenheim people and I had a good time together. Love you, Blenheim. So if you brought your copy of God's Word and you want to follow along with me, I'm going to be bouncing through a couple of, of parts, uh, specifically of James 1, because I want to look at a couple of things. We want to talk about this morning, what does prayer look like in trial? Likely, all of us in this room have gone through seasons of our lives of immense difficulty, ranging for different reasons and for different time spans. But often, I think of, and again, low-hanging fruit, I'm really sorry, trial as a marathon of the soul, where God is actually up to something for something in us, and it's our job to be faithful to him. And going through that. So if you want to look with me at James 1, we're just going to read the first few verses together, and then I want to stop and talk about them. And this first sentence drives me nuts. 
It says this in verse 2. Uh, so James, the half-brother half of Jesus, is writing. Uh, he's also the elder of the church in Jerusalem, and he's writing to the scattered believers or outside of Jerusalem. He says this, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. Consider that pure joy, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may uh, be mature and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and will, it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all we do. What's interesting is, uh, so Mark and I are, I'm going to say we're good friends. He doesn't want to be my friend, right? But we're good friends. Um, he's like my big brother in the Lord. So we've been talking at length about his training. So again, the fun thing about running marathons is you have to practice. Does anyone know how you practice running a long race? You run shorter races repeatedly. So basically, to prepare for long suffering, you suffer in other increments be leading up to that long suffering. So Mark didn't just run this race this morning. He texted me. And here's the thing, friends. If I'm running a marathon, I'm going to focus on breathing. Mark is texting me as we speak updates on his race because that's what a man does. I wouldn't be, but he's text. I'm halfway done. Good for you. Psychopath. Right? But the end goal for Mark was always this race, which is an amazing end goal. Think about that for a second. He started off with smaller increments doing 2 kilometers, 5 kilometers, 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers, 30 kilometers, now doing 34. Each leg of that sucked. It hurt every time. And then he would add more and more and more so that he was preparing for this. If he didn't prepare, he would not finish the race. In order for him to cross this finish line and get his well-deserved high five, he had to prepare for this. Now, the reality is that we as Christians also have a finish line. Hebrews 12, the first few verses say this, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he, Christ, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow uh, weary or lose heart. So the author of Hebrews is likening our faith to a race. He then uses Christ as an example for us to follow in running that race. Notice that James, in, in our first few verses, says, Consider it joy. He doesn't say enjoy. Consider the trial joy, not necessarily enjoy the trial. Jesus isn't, uh, didn't get nailed to the cross for fun. He did not enjoy that. It was the joy on the other side that propelled him forward. And we need to run with perseverance like Christ did. Well, how do we grow in perseverance? Through training, through trial. We are being trained through difficulty so that we can grow in perseverance and therefore grow, uh, cross the finish line. Perseverance isn't the end goal, however. It's the means to the end. To be mature, complete, not lacking anything. Doesn't that sound good? Wouldn't we all like to be able to run a marathon without training for it? To be fully complete and lacking. What? Show what? Your, show your back. <sighs> Consider this pure joy.
but I'm not going to speak any heresy, okay? Is this on? Boom. <laughs> Don't tell Mark. <laughs> Is that on? Are we recording? Are we live? Don't do that. You and I are all running a race toward completedness in Christ. The race is hard, and there are going to be difficult legs of it. We will only get through if we've trained and prepared. All right. This is going to be a little more difficult holding this microphone. Now, what's waiting for us on the other side? What's the promise to us for crossing that finish line? Well, in verse 12, he says, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person receives the, will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, the crown that he's talking about, the Greek word for crown, isn't the one that Jesus got and, and gets, which is a kingly crown. It's the one that they would use in ancient Greek for the winner of an Olympic event. So we get, for completing our race, a victor's crown. And we only get that crown if we persevere under trial. Remember that James read, we read in James there, that um, we need to let perseverance finish its work. Well, in Greek, what, what the literal translation is to hold on to perseverance. So if you've ever helped your buddy move, I recently did that, like a month and a half ago. Listen, we all do things in the name of love. So this, this blessed woman comes to our church with her kids. Her husband is not yet a believer. And so we're doing everything we can, you know, to, to seal that deal. So you remember, I don't know, maybe you had it here or not. We had the wickedest of blizzards in Sarnia. And so this person, these, this couple had like 1,247 U-Haul trucks of stuff. And there was a blizzard. And it was covering everything in snow. So you would grab something heavy and you would, and you would slide down the ramp, and we had a guy who was a catcher. No, not that kind of catcher. Uh, he, he would stop you from coming and falling and killing yourself. True story. And when we were done the truck, just like a marathon, we were halfway done, and there were more trucks. But what James is saying is to hold on to perseverance. Don't let it go. Don't give up. Let perseverance finish its work so that you can... Get the crown. We only get it if we finish. Now, here's the deal. Mark, again, low-hanging fruit, sorry. Mark is running a race. If Mark gives up halfway through his race, one, he does not get his high five. Two, Marcia will savagely make fun of him. Seriously, she has a very quick wit. He will not hear the end of it. Crowns are for winners. And Jesus wants us to be victorious. His hope for you, his hope for me, is not that we will fail. He is preparing us specifically so that we don't. Now, the question is, what does prayer look like when we are in trial? How are we supposed to pray when we are in trial? Well, what I'm going to argue is that prayer is actually most of the point the way that we get through trial, the way that we get through difficulty is actually through prayer. So he says, consider it pure joy. Without prayer, we can't succeed. How are we supposed to consider it pure joy? James is trying to affect our outlook. Why? Because our outlook affects the outcome. If our outlook is off... We're going to miss the point of what Jesus has been up to the whole time through the trial. So what does James say for us to do? He says to pray. If you need wisdom, ask. The solution to the problem of perseverance, the solution to the trial isn't try harder. It's pray. It's God's grace. It isn't more effort. It's asking God for his help. And then he goes on to say that we need to trust God when we ask. Now, there are three kinds of trial that we need to talk about, okay? 
So the first kind of trial is the human kind. We get sick. Uh, we live in a sinful, fallen world. Our car breaks down. We get a flat tire. Uh, we lose our job. There's a number of things that will happen to us in the realm and rhythm of life simply because of the world in which we live. So there's human trial. There's a second kind of trial. The reality, for those of us who are Christians, we have an enemy. We sang uh, an awesome song uh, that I loved a lot, calling him out pretty hard. But we have an enemy who hates us. And so there are some things that we go through, not because we're human, but because we're Christian. Where do you want me to put this microphone? Up here? Is this good? Yeah. Cool. Dude, you can just yell at me. You with the iPad. I see you. Just only PG hand gestures, though. Okay? So there's a second kind, because we are Christian. The third kind is because God loves you, and God as a loving father is going to discipline his children. So two of them he doesn't cause. One of them he does. Why? Because he's trying to grow you, grow us, to complete the race that's before us. But the first thing that Satan's going to try and do is convince you that God isn't good. His first play is to try and convince you that God is actually holding out on you. That is what he did to Eve. And that, he, that is what he's been trying to do to us ever since. When difficulty hits, we are to pray and ask God to show us what he is up to and what we are supposed to do. We are asking for wisdom. Why? Because wisdom is required for maturity which is the whole point, the crown at the end, being mature, complete, lacking nothing. Now, what we, need, what we know about God needs to encounter experience. I always say to my people that uh, wisdom is knowledge plus experience equals wisdom. And wisdom plus experience equals maturity. We can ask God for wisdom, for insight, for guidance, for, for leading us through that, and we can't doubt. Now, this is not prosperity gospel. No matter what Mark preaches here on Sunday, just don't tell him, right? But no matter what you guys hear, we can't name it and claim it. That is not how this works. We are not trying to force God to submit to us if we just have enough faith. That's not what's taking place here. In fact, James goes on. In a minute, we're going to hit this verse that explains why we can trust God. And we read it in uh, James 1, 17 to 18. And it says this. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be the first, a, a kind of first fruits. Okay. Again, normally I have two hands. I apologize. So when we pray and we ask, we aren't trying to manipulate God to do what we want, right? And we aren't doubting his goodness. The reason why we are asking is because God is good. We are asking because God has been good. What does James say? He says that God does not change. Not like shifting shadows. Not like us. He prays and says, don't be wavering. Well, God doesn't waver. He's unwavering. And he doesn't change. And so if God has been good, logically, he can't change. That means logically, he will always be what? Good. And so what's the proof of that? Well, James writes, every objectively good thing you have is a gift from God. What's the proof of that? He talks about our salvation. The very fact that God has saved us by his grace and his mercy is proof, is evidence of his goodness. So if God was willing to give us new life, new birth, by spirit and truth, what will he hold, out, uh, hold back from us? Nothing. So when we need wisdom, we must ask, trusting that God will in his goodness respond. Because he has always been good. I just want to touch base uh, on, on something that has kind of shifted how I've been thinking about prayer. 
often, I'm going to read a, a couple of verses for us, and often when we, we hear these verses, we immediately think about human relationships, which is great and is very much applicable for human relationships, and it's how I preached it a few weeks ago. In verse 19, he says this, My brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the, the righteousness that God desires. Flippy, flippy. So how do our prayers normally go in trial? How are you doing at this principle? I, I love this principle. Um, who's, ever, who's ever read the book, Seven Habits for Highly Effective People? A few of us. Nice. Highly recommend it. The author, Stephen Covey, uh, has written some great principles in there for us to be effective. And one of those is seek first to understand and then be understood. James writes and says, be eager to listen, be eager to hear and not make others hear you and don't be easily angered. Well, how do our prayers primarily work in trial? How many of us take time to pray and ask God what he's up to? before we blast him with exactly how we feel about what he's up to. Don't be easily angered. How quick to anger do we get? If I ask for another show of hands, I'm not gonna. I bet you not many of us in this room are batting a thousand on this. In our prayers, James urges us to seek wisdom, to seek to understand where God is, and what he is doing. Not just make God hear us. And to be slow to become defensive and slow to anger. As a pastor, one of the things I hear most often from people who are going through it is, Matt, I just can't do this anymore. How many of you prayed that, or thought that, or said that? I just can't do this anymore. Do you know what my response is? And yet, you are. So if you are here this morning and you're in a spot where you think, Matt, I just can't do this anymore, I'm going to say to you, and yet, you're doing it. See, God doesn't put us in situations that we just can't do anymore. He puts us in, in situations exclusively to build into us perseverance. His goal is to grow us, not to make us fail. And I think part of the reason why we pray Part of the reason why we, we say that, and then I say to them, so can you really not do this anymore? Nine times out of ten, they'll shift, and they'll go, you know what? No, I just don't want to. And really, our prayer comes from the place of, this is uncomfortable, this sucks, I don't want to do this anymore. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that a disturbance has entered our lives, and we want to get back to our regular scheduled programming as quickly, as humanly, or supernaturally possible. We need to understand that God's will for us isn't our regularly scheduled program. How do I know? Well, lastly, I want to draw our attention to the word blessed. It comes up a couple of times in the text, specifically in verse 12 and verse 25. It brings up the fact that we will be blessed in all we do. God wants us to be doers of the word, not simply hearers of the word. And so he's going to take the things that we know about God, and he's going to test us. He's going to give us opportunity to put it into practice, to prove that we have learned it. So the word blessed, when that promise, we hear that promise, oh, so if, if I'm obedient to God, if I do what God wants, us to, wants me to do, if I hold on to perseverance, if I keep running the race so that I get my high five at the end, then I'm going to be blessed in everything that I do. That word does not mean you are going to hit every shot that you make. You are not Steph Curry. I'm a Warriors fan. They lost last night. I don't want to talk about it. It doesn't mean that the rain on your crops, Blenheim people, will always be on your crops. I don't know what they do in Blenheim. I'm assuming there's farming. Something like that? Yeah, we're, we're doing good? All right. And you Chatham people, whatever Chatham things you have. What? More farming. Oh. Okay. Um, it doesn't mean 
that everything's going to be sunshine and rainbows. That's not what the word blessed. That's not the promise. This word blessed, the Greek word is markelios. And what that actually means is an inner reality, not an outer one. What it means is to be blessed in everything you do, God's blessing is that he wants you to become increasingly less bothered or unbothered by difficult things. The real definition of someone who has experienced God's blessing of Markelios is that they are, they are in the world but not dependent on it. And that their satisfaction is in God in all things, in all situations, not in their circumstances. Someone uh, that has been kind of an inspiration to me, I'm not going to say they're a shining moral example. Um, his name is David Goggins. Anyone know David Goggins? Yeah. One cool person? Nice. Um, he, re he wrote a book that actually changed my life, um, and it was called Can't Hurt Me. And what's interesting with David Goggins is he had a really rough upbringing. Uh, his dad was a club owner, he was a pimp and a drug dealer, and he would beat his son David regularly. Uh, David had to overcome a lot of uh, internal demons and battles. Um, and what makes David distinct and unique is that he's the only living person to be a Navy SEAL and pass Ranger school. So the Navy SEALs and the, and the Rangers are two of the most elite fighting forces on our planet. And he has the distinct privilege of passing both of those. He also, just for fun, runs. So here's the thing. Mark's going to walk in here. Mark's going to imagine he's going to walk in here like this on Sunday. Really, he's going to be like this, right? But he ran a 34-kilometer. Dope. David runs 100-mile races, and he does it in 24 hours without sleep or fun. He also holds the, the world record or has held the world record chin-up thing. Guinness, but like, why? Who decides? He trained for that, too. Again, more pain, more suffering. Why? What's really interesting is, I, before I read the book, and I found him, YouTube knows me, YouTube watches me, and so YouTube knows what I want to watch. And so I saw this interview pop up with this dude, David Goggins, and this guy asked him, why am I saying this? He asked him this question, David, how are you able to accomplish everything you have accomplished and overcome everything you've overcome? And David's answer changed my life, and I'm going to give it to you, the clean version. He said, I got really comfortable being really uncomfortable. Let me say that again. I got really comfortable being really uncomfortable. Friends, I don't even like going outside. It's uncomfortable outside. Have you been outside? I spent a lot of money on an inside. Camping, not my idea. I don't even like the beach. Every time, every time Mark goes away, he's at the beach, he's sending me photos going, hey, I'm, I'm everywhere you hate. The sun, the, the sand, the water, yuck, don't like it. It's uncomfortable. David said he got real, it's, it's hot, it sticks to you. Like, no one likes that, right? And then, oh, sunburn. You have to apply stuff to your skin so you don't die. What is that? What catches me is that David's response to how he was able to accomplish everything he accomplished was that he got really comfortable being really uncomfortable. What catches me, friends, is that that is literally what Markyrios is. Our fuel for considering it pure joy, for making it through the trial, whatever that trial is, the ability for us to do that is intently studying the Word of God and doing it so that the Holy Spirit can respond with fruit. Really quick reminder of the fruit of the Spirit found in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, uh, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. So how do we consider it pure joy? How do we have joy in the trial? By allowing the Spirit to work in us. God's work in you and in me isn't to get us through difficulty as fast as possible so that we can get back to our healthy, li healthy, happy lives. Rather, God's work in us is so that we can grow in greater blessing. And that blessing is to help us be satisfied in every situation, to help us be comfortable being uncomfortable, so that when life is hard, 
when we get hit by trial, either by human, by the devil, or by our loving Father, or when God asks us to step up in a big way, we are unbothered by it. Because in this life, trouble is guaranteed. Jesus Christ himself said, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So trial, friends, is not a question of if. It's a question of when. And so God, being faithful to finish the work he started in us, is going to lead us through and get us through these difficult things. See, God loves you and wants you to succeed. So he is going to prepare you. He's not going to throw you at the starting line of a, of a marathon without first training you to do those things. My man, there's no altar call. Sorry. <laughs> Don't tell Mark. Because life is going to be hard. It's not an easy race. God has to prepare us for it. That is the blessing. God isn't trying to get us through the uncomfortable to the comfortable. He's trying to get us to be comfortable being really uncomfortable. Um, my brother, I'm going to put this down. There's a, I got, I got a, yep, bam. Um, my brother is uh, two years younger than me, and he's taller and more handsome and faster and more athletic and cooler than me in every way. Um, so my brother, uh, one of the things that connects Mark and I together is the fact that we're both American. So don't throw anything. Yeah. Ooh, I got a woo. Let's go. Yes, sister, I see you. Um, uh, so I was born in the States. My dad's still American, married a Canadian girl. And uh, so all of us kids were born in the States. So my brother uh, decided that he would do something funny and go on Christian Mingle and found a wife. Oops. Um, and she just so happened to be a lieutenant colonel's daughter. So Jeremy decided, you know, he would activate his long, uh, endormant man dreams of joining the army. And so my brother's like a really low achiever because he never tried at anything. So we're like, okay, man, you know, best of luck to you. So then he went and he took his aptitude test and he scored in the 96th percentile. Uh, what that means is of everyone who's ever taken the army aptitude test, he's smarter than 96% of them. So they offered him like a plethora of jobs. And so Jeremy, my brother, uh, loved the idea of being a combat medic. And so he went through basic training, and then he went through medic training, which was a, a whole big thing. And then when he came on the other side of that, he was like, ah, you know, well, let's try for the airborne, because, you know, saving people on the ground is boring. I'd rather jump out of a plane to get there. And so then he passed airborne school, and then he, he did a tour in Afghanistan. He was stationed in Kabul for a number of months. And avoided death and uh, experiences that I could share with you that I won't. And then while he was there, uh, you know, as a soldier does, he got bored and was reading an army magazine and decided that jumping out of planes and helicopters was getting old and he wanted to fly them instead. So the picture you see is the Black Hawk that my brother flies for the American military. If that's not the coolest thing you ever saw, I don't know what is. And I'm a church planner, so basically we have the same job. Um, and uh, why am I telling you this? Because uh, one of the things I love about the internet is my brother and I swap audios all the time through WhatsApp. We just send messages back and forth and uh, encourage each other and share experiences. When my brother got accepted into the uh, pilot program, he was stationed in Germany. So they had to cycle him back during COVID so that he could do the training. And then he had to do something called SEER school. And if you're not familiar with SEER, it stands for Survive, Evade, Resist, Escape. And uh, what they do in SEER school, before they even put you behind a stick uh, to fly, is uh, train you to understand and be able to survive should your helicopter go down in enemy territory and you have to get out. And so they taught him to do all kinds of things. They uh, taught him how to live in city environments, how to avoid detection during the day. They would literally starve you in Seer so that you'd be desperate enough to actually eat the things that you find in dumpsters. And then they would take you out of that environment and they taught you how to live in... Check. Nice. I'm, dude, I don't know what's with microphones today. Um, 
where they, they would teach you how to build camps and fires and survive. And he was in Louisiana, so at nighttime there were spiders as big as my head that would come down. Yes, I know. So you'd have to walk in a straight line, and you have one person with a stick in front doing this to bat away, yes, the spiders and the snakes that were hanging down from the trees. And, uh, and then you'd have to learn how to trap animals. So he had to learn how to trap a rabbit and be hungry enough to break its neck with his bare hands and then skin and eat it, whether he had a fire source or not. So that is survive and evade, how to, how to not get captured and survive on your own in the wilderness. The R stands for resist. And so what they would do is they essentially simulated what interrogation and torture would be like. So my brother uh, was taken into a, uh, a, a situation with a number of guys in his class where they were told that you can only give name, rank, serial number, and they would ask him all kinds of questions, and then they would beat him to try and get him to give up details of his life. Uh, and then at one situation, he was stripped naked and forced to stand at attention in a metal can that was too uh, small lengthwise and depthwise to lay down in. And he had to stand at attention for 14 straight hours. And the deal was that if they came back and checked on you, and they, they, had, they checked on you every few minutes or so, and you weren't standing at attention because you had passed out or sat down or whatever, they would beat the person next to you. So my brother was beaten a number of times simply because his cellmates had fallen asleep. Why am I telling you this? You're like, pastor, way to end on a high note, right? Why am I telling you this? Well, here's the question. Why would the army do this? It got so bad, there are blaring things over the loudspeaker by his ear that are inhumane. They all required psychological evaluation before returning to their families. Why would they do this? Because it would be unloving for them not to. Yeah. Isn't that funny? But imagine Jeremy's helicopter did go down, and he didn't know how to survive. He didn't know how to evade. He had no experience resisting, and he never escaped. What would he do then? See, the, the thing about this is that they never hit him in the face and they never hit him in the groin. They weren't actually trying to injure him. They were trying to help him be comfortable being really uncomfortable because they need him to succeed, because lives depend on him succeeding. God, I know, weird stretch. Listen, friends, you have an enemy that hates you. And God has plans for your life. God needs to prepare you for those. You into a situation that you were not ready for. What did David say before he slayed Goliath? Lions and bears I've already done. God's prepared me for this. He's doing the same thing for you. So for my brother to have the glory of flying this beauty, he had to go through that. And for you to experience the glory of the crown that God has for you, you are going through and experiencing what you are. And God's intent is not to injure you. So in our prayers, let's not be defensive. Let's not get angry. Let's ask him, Lord, what are we working on today? I need your wisdom. I need your counsel because you're good. And I know that there's good in this for me somewhere. Let's pray. Team, why don't you come? Father God, uh, grateful for Forward City Church. Grateful for uh, this city, for Chatham. Grateful for the ministry and the work that you are doing here. I'm grateful for um, the nine years that this church has been a, a beacon, an example to the community of your love and your kindness and your faithfulness. And so, Lord, just for my brothers and sisters here this morning who are struggling, um, going through trial and difficulty, I pray, Lord, and I ask that you would reveal your goodness to them, your grace to them, your mercy to them, Lord, that you would be at work powerfully. God, remind us how good you are and how much you love us. Help us persevere so that maybe we may experience the true blessing, God, that you have for us, and that's an inner reality, not an outer one. Your goodness to us is that you truly will um, Give us everything we need when we need it. 
we have everything we need for today. And that promise is true. And Lord, you've promised us a crown at the end. Whatever difficult season is going on in people's lives, Lord, this will not be our whole life. It's temporary. So God, as we celebrate with Mark uh, what he's accomplishing today, Lord, let that be a reminder to us that you are training and that you are preparing for us to have success in what you're calling us to. We pray in Jesus' name.